The Boy on the Wooden Box, Epilogue. In the United States, I rarely spoke about my experiences during the war. It was too hard to explain to people. There didn't even seem to be a vocabulary to communicate what I had gone through. For Americans, a word like camp evoked a happy summer memories that were nothing like what I experienced at Plaza and Gross Rosen. I remember once shortly after we were settled in Los Angeles, I tried to describe to a neighbor what it was like to be starving in the ghetto. When I said we never had enough to eat, he responded, we had rationing here too. He had no clue of the difference between what he had experienced in having only small quantities of butter and meat during the war and what I had experienced scrounging through garbage, searching for a potato peel. There wasn't really a way to talk about my experiences Without seeming to belittle, he is so I decided not to talk about Poland and the war. Like the hat I had left behind on the train, I tried to leave those years behind me as I began a new life. Of course, unlike a hat, one cannot walk away from memories, and those memories stayed with me every day. My parents and I tried to focus on getting settled and finding work. We stayed with my Aunt Shana, now known as Jenny, for a few weeks before moving into a one-bedroom apartment in the building where my Uncle Morris, my mother's brother, lived. My parents took the bedroom, and I set up a cot for myself in the kitchen, a definite upgrade from the crowded bunks of the concentration camps. I felt very grateful. The three of us enrolled in English for foreign-born classes three nights a week at Manual Arts High School. Soon, my father took a job as a janitor at an elementary school. It was not the same as being the respected craftsman he had been before the war, but he did his, the best he could and continued to feel optimistic. At 50 plus years, with limited English skills, he had few options. I worked on an assembly line at a factory that made shopping carts. In the beginning, it was good to have repetitive tasks that did not require speaking much English, but I knew that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing this kind of work. My mother had an especially difficult time learning English. Eventually, she acquired enough of vocabulary to be able to shop and talk with the neighbors. She and my father joined the Narwaka Benevolent Club, which had been founded by the Jews who had immigrated to the United States in the early 1900s. Periodically, the club would get together to sing and dance, reminisce, and raise money to help various charities. How fortunate my parents felt to be on the giving end. My mother devoted herself to caring for my father and making a home for us. Separated from the world in which she had grown up, she seemed happy. She seemed to me to be lonely and adrift. Of course, she could never stop thinking about the son she had lost, especially Salig, because she had stood by helpless as he had been taken away. I learned languages easily, so it didn't take me long to feel comfortable conversing in English. With the help of Uncle Morris, I was hired as a machinist at U.S. Electrical Motors and enrolled in classes at the Los Angeles Trade Technical College. I was learning from books what my father had learned by doing, but we worked together to master challenges of converting metric measurements to the equivalents in inches, feet, and yards. For a year and a half, I went to classes in the morning and worked in the afternoon and evenings until midnight. After getting off my shift, I would sleep on the back of the bus on the ride home. The bus driver was a kind man who would wake me just before my stop. Early in the morning, I would start the routine all over again. It was hard, but I didn't think about it that way. Hard had been the grueling work at Plazal. My schedule was tiring, but the work was worthwhile and interesting. Though I was draft age as the Korean War began, I was exempt from service as long as I was enrolled as a student. In 1959, I finished my trade, course, trade school courses. And like clockwork, even though I wasn't a U.S. citizen, my U.S. Army draft notice arrived in the mail. At first, I went to Fort Ord in Monterey, California for basic training and then to Aberdeen, Maryland. For many young men accustomed to a civilian life with freedom and personal privacy, military life was tough and there was a lot of grumbling. I listened to their gripes and just smiled. I had a cot to myself, decent clothes, and more than enough food, and I was being paid. What was there to complain about? When drill sergeants yell at us for not doing a better job spit polishing our shoes, I said to myself, well, I won't be shot for that. I made friends with guys from places I'd never heard of, Kentucky, Louisiana, North and South Dakota and other states. When they asked me where I was from, I just told them LA. By now, my English was good enough to get away with such a cocky response. Near the end of my training, I was transferred to a base outside Atlanta, Georgia. One weekend, we received passes to go into the city. After boarding the shuttle to town, I went to my favorite spot in the back to catch some shut-eye. 
I was startled when the driver stopped the bus and walked back to me. You can't sit there, he said. The back seats are for Negroes. You have to move to the front of the bus. His words hit me like a hard slap. Suddenly, I flash back to Krakow when the Nazis ordered us Jews to the back of the bus before they forbade us from traveling on public transportation altogether. The context was very different, but nonetheless, it made my head explode. Why would something like this exist in America? I had mistakenly believed that such discrimination was unique to Jews suffering under Nazi oppression. Now I discovered there was inequality and prejudice in this country that I had already come to love. Uh, this is a really important point that I think we're going to come back to when he realizes this discrimination exists here. Before my overseas assignment was made, I was tested in several European languages. The United States still had many military facilities in Europe. When I earned ratings of fluent in German, Polish, and Russian, I expected to be stationed in Germany or Poland. Instead, I was given an assignment in the opposite direction, Okinawa, Japan. I spent 16 months on Okinawa, oops, sorry about that, where I served with, an army, with a unit of army engineers. I supervised 21 Okinawans in a machine shop and rose from a rank of private first class to corporal. To me, this was, that was a big deal. I treasured those two stripes in the sleeve of my U.S. Army uniform. When I was discharged and returned to the United States, I made up my mind to continue my education. The GI Bill made that possible. I met with a counselor at Los Angeles City College who asked me for my high school diploma. I explained that I didn't have one, that my formal education had ended just after I turned 10. He looked baffled, so I volunteered enough details to explain my past. The counselor reviewed my army experience and something clicked. He suggested that I consider becoming an industrial arts teacher. If you maintain a C average, you can stay in school and get your degree, he asserted. I couldn't believe it. That's all I have to do? I asked. He assured me it was. I ended up with much better than a C average. I graduated from LACC and transferred to Cal State Los Angeles, where I completed my bachelor's degree and earned a teaching credential. In time, I earned a master's degree in education from Pepperdine University. I started teaching at Huntington Park High School in 1959. I stayed at the school for 39 years. As one decade passed into another, I put my World War II experience even further behind me. Occasionally, when someone noticed a trace of my accident and asked me where I came from, I would reply vaguely, from the East. I didn't clarify that I meant something other than the East Coast or the United States. As much as I had moved on and made a life for myself, it wasn't until I met my future wife, Liz, that I felt I could truly heal. In my sixth year at Huntington Park, January 1965, she came to teach English as a second language and immediately caught my eye. I guess I made an impression on her, too. She had intended to stay in Southern California for one semester, but I changed her mind. We spent a great deal of time together over the next months. I began to tell her about my past. Stories... I told no one else since arriving in the United States. By the end of the semester, we were in love. We married that summer. We moved to Fullerton, California a few years later. We have a daughter and a son whom we raised as normal American kids without the burden of a family's past. I did not share my childhood and teenage experiences with them until they were old enough to understand. I wanted to give our children a legacy of freedom, not a legacy of fear. Of course, I gradually shared my past with them in increments as they grew older. My brother and sister also married and had families of their own in Israel. David has three brother, has three, three boys and a girl and still lives in a kibbutz, in kibbutz Gan Shmuel, famous for its orchards and exports of fruit concentrates and tropical fish. Pesa changed her name to Aviva after she immigrated to Israel. She has three children and six grandchildren and a baby great-granddaughter. She lives in Kiryat Haim, a beautiful town on the Mediterranean north of Haifa. It was harder for my parents than for me to find their way in the new country. They had survived unimaginable, the unimaginable as had three of their children, but the war ripped a hole in their hearts that would never heal. There was not a day they didn't think of Herschel and Zalig and all the family they had lost. Physically, the years of suffering had taken a toll. One time, when we were in Plezo, a guard struck my mother on the side of her head with a wood plank. 
The blow permanently shattered her eardrum. She said for the rest of her life, she could hear her two murdered sons calling to her in that ear. My father continued to take English classes. So determined was he to master the language. He moved from a custodial job to one in a factory as a machinist. Soon his skill as an expert craftsman became apparent, and that helped him to regain some of the pride and self-respect he had enjoyed in the years before the war. He rarely spoke about what we had gone through during World War II. He continued to be the center of my mother's world. When he died in 1971, it was fortunate that she had two grandchildren living close to her to help her through the grief. She died five years after my father. Schindler struggled after the war. His brand of wartime wheeling and dealing was not appropriate for a businessman in peacetime. He had a series of unsuccessful businesses, business ventures, that, and went bankrupt more than once. Near the end of his life, he lived on contributions he received from Jewish organizations. You got to think about how interesting that is that an ex that a Nazi was receiving um, contributions from Jewish organizations. It goes to show that he was really what they called a, a righteous Gentile. To many of his fellow Germans, Schindler had been a traitor to his country, a Jew lover. In 1974, Schindler died in humble circumstances in Hildesheim in what was then West Germany. Up until his death, Schindler kept in touch with some of his former workers. Our gratitude meant a great deal to him. He thought of us, the Schindler Juden, the Schindler Jews, as the children he never had. He asked to be buried in Jerusalem. My children are here, he once said. He is interned on Mount Zion, the only member of the Nazi party buried there. If you visit his grave, you will see it covered with small stones and pebbles, tokens of remembrances, uh, remembrance left by those who knew him and those who didn't, but those who remember the lives he saved and the courage he showed. Now and again, I met other Schindler Juden in the United States. I reconnected with Mike Tanner, who had worked on a machine near mine in Schindler's factory in Krakow. Leopold Page, who was quite a bit older than I, was devoted to Schindler and made it his life's goal to educate the world about Schindler, or about who Schindler was and what he had done. I met Mr. Page when he came to talk with my parents about his project to help Schindler. He and his wife, Mila, were at the airport the day Schindler came to Los Angeles in 1965. It was surreptitious when writer Thomas Keneally walked into the luggage store that the Pages owned in Beverly Hills and became fascinated by the story Mr. Page told him. Page celebrated the publication of Keneally's book, Schindler's Art, Schindler's List in the United States, in 1982 and contributed valuable insight to the 1993 Spielberg film, Schindler's List. Leopold Page died in 2001. Um, I never showed Schindler's List in class. It is, I believe, more of a, an adult film. A couple kids have asked and parents have asked about watching that. If you are interested in watching that film, I suggest you talk to your parents about that and, and watch it with them because there is um, more adult content than, than this book. Uh, Page's wife, Mila, who is also on the list, is still living and is a dear friend. She is the last surviving founding member of the 1939 Club, an organization of Holocaust survivors mostly from Poland and their descendants. My own life changed with the release of, the, of Spielberg's movie Schindler's List. Until the film, film, I had remained mostly silent about my past. When there was such an enormous interest in the movie, I began rethinking my, rethinking my reluctance to talk about my experiences. Shortly after the movie's release, Dennis McCohen, a reporter from the Los Angeles Times, found me through Spielberg's company. He telephoned her house and left a message with his phone number requesting an interview. I ignored the call for a couple days until Lise encouraged me to give him the courtesy of a yes or a no. By that time, I had made up my mind. I would give him a definite no. I wasn't ready to do an interview about my Holocaust experiences. Mr. McClellan was a persistent reporter, too clever and persistent, and too persistent for me, because by the end of our phone conversation, I had agreed he could come to our house for, just for a chat. One evening, he came over after work. As we talked, I quickly was charmed by his sincere interest and concern. When he politely asked if he could use his tape recorder, I saw no reason to object. By then, he had my complete confidence. After we talked for several hours, he asked if he could take my picture. I agreed, expecting to pull out a camera. Instead, he opened our front door and called out, Okay, you can come in. 
A photographer who had arrived with Mr. McClellan hours earlier stepped inside and snapped several photos with me. The following Sunday, January 23rd, 1994, my story and my photo ran on the front page of the Orange County edition of the Los Angeles Times. After the article appeared, my students and my fellow teachers mobbed me at school. One young man, who had not done particularly well in my class, came running up to me on campus. He grabbed my hand, shook it, and said, Mr. Layson, I'm so glad you made it. I've never forgotten the total genuineness of his response. Friends, students, and teachers asked me why I had never told them about what I experienced during the war. I didn't have a good answer. May I be? I hadn't really been ready to speak about my experiences. I had uh, until so many years later, or maybe people hadn't really been ready to listen, or maybe both. Sorry about the shaky hands here today. Ugh. The outpouring of interest from the community touched me deeply. I began to invite invitation. I began to accept invitations to share my story at churches, synagogues, schools, and political, military, civic, and philanthropic organizations locally and across the United States and Canada. In 1995, I met Dr. Marilyn Heron, a professor and founding director of the Rogers Center for Holocaust Education at Chapman University in Orange, California. With her encouragement, I began to speak at Chapman and other venues. Chapman has become a second home to me. I will always cherish the memory of the graduation ceremony in 2011 when the university presented me with an honorary doctorate of humane letters. With my wife, my children, my grandchildren, and many friends there, it was one of the proudest days of my life. A little boy who had been told he wasn't good enough to go to school was now Dr. Layson. I can only imagine the pride my parents would have felt. They never would have believed that a wonderful television newsman in Los Angeles named Fritz Coleman, who would decide to talk with me some more and then create a half-hour news special, my story, A Child on Schindler's List, was broadcast on KNBC in December 2008. I was thrilled when Fritz and his colleague, Kimber Limponi, won a local Emmy for their work. And I believe if you Google that, you can find that um, interview on YouTube. I've actually watched it before, and it's very similar to what we've read, but if you're interested, you can find that. I speak often now. My talks are unrehearsed. I never use notes, so every talk is different. I say what I am moved to say. When I speak, I follow the same story you've been reading. It's never easy to recount what I lived through, no matter how many years or how much distance I put between myself and the boy I once was. Each time I speak, I feel again the pain of watching my parents suffer, the cold and hunger of all those nights in Plaza and the loss of my two brothers. That moment when Salig was torn away from us haunts me every day. As I've grown older and become a parent myself, my admiration for my own parents and all they did to attempt to protect us has grown even greater as has my admiration for Oscar Schindler. Over the years, from books and documentaries, and especially from my fellow Schindler's List survivors, I have learned much more about what Schindler did and how much he hazarded to protect our lives. His accountant, Isaac Stern, thought that Schindler committed to saving Jews after he witnessed the mass killings during the liquidation of the Krakow Ghetto. He was already sympathetic to the plight of his Jewish workers, but from that time on, he increased his efforts to save as many Jews as he could. With money from the Black Park Fit dealings, he bought a piece of land adjacent to his Amalia factory, built the barracks, and persuaded Commandant Goeth with smooth talk and substantial amounts of money that having his workers nearby would increase productivity. His real goal was to rescue his workers from Plazao and the sadistic Goeth. Um, I know I'm not pronouncing his name right, but we're doing our best here. Schindler courageously took risks despite the possible dire consequences. He constantly attracted suspicion for his corruption and for his unorthodox treatment of Jews. During the years of unprecedented inhumanity, Schindler saw value in the very people the Nazis had labeled as less than human and sought to eradicate. For the most part, he wooed those in authority and those who were surely his enemies by showering them with generous bribes and gifts that were simply too tempting for most high-ranking Nazis camp commandants, SS officers, and local police to refuse. And he certainly knew how to throw a party. In 1943, 
Schindler was arrested and briefly jailed for his black market activities. That same year, the Nazis threatened to close his factory if he didn't switch from producing enamelware to making armaments. Schindler was forced to agree, but ironically, that change was what saved our lives near the end of the war when Schindler argued that his expert workers had to be moved to Brunelitz. An argument that he had essential enamel workers wouldn't have meant anything to the decision makers, but the argument that we were essential to Germany's munitions production did. Um, munitions and armament, that meant like weapons stuff, right? When other German factory owners took their profits and fled Krakow, intent on saving their lives and fortunes, Schindler increased his efforts to save his Jews. Had he not done so, most of us would have died in Auschwitz or in other camps. Even though we were close to starving at the end of the time in Brunlitz, we managed to survive because Schindler chose to spend his fortune on buying us food. He did everything in his power to protect us. Thanks to him, it turns out I didn't die from the last bullet of the war after all. As a Jewish kid during those times, I fought to live every day. I didn't have a choice. As an influential Nazi, Schindler did have a choice. Countless times he could have abandoned us, taken his fortune, and fled. He could have decided that his life depended on working us to death, but he didn't. Instead, he put his own life in danger every time he protected us for no other reason than it was the right thing to do. I am not a philosopher, but I believe Oskar Schindler defines heroism. He proves that one person can stand up to evil and make a difference. I am living proof of that. I recall a television interview I once saw with scholar and writer Joseph Campbell. I never forgot his definition of a hero. Campbell said that a hero is an ordinary human who does the best of things in the worst of times. Oscar Schindler personifies that definition. For years after the war, I searched for my brother Salig in crowds. I would see a young, young man who resembled him, and for a split second, I would feel a surge of hope. He has come back, I thought. He escaped. If anyone could do it, my superhero brother could. Each time, hope turned into bitter disappointment. Salig had not escaped. He did not magically reappear, not in the ghetto, not anywhere. Years later, I learned that no one had survived from the transport that took Salik and Miriam to Belzec. My wife Liz and I still live in Fullerton, California, where we settled on our sixth anniversary in 1971. Our daughter, Constance, Stacy, Miriam, and her husband, David, live in Virginia and have three sons, Nicholas, Tyler, and Brian. Tyler has the middle name Jacob to honor the memory of my grandfathers. Our son, Daniel, and his wife, Camille, live in Los Angeles and have one daughter... Mia and two and twin sons, Benjamin and Silas. Daniel has the middle name Salig, and so does his son Benjamin. Both Salig's name and something of his spirit live on in them. I am certain of it. Leon Layson, September fifteenth, two thousand twelve.